صلوا على محمد وآل محمد اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد أعوذ بالله من الشيطان اللعين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على خاتم الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا ونبينا محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين اللهم صل على محمد وعلى صلى الله عليه وعلى آله الطيبين الطاهرين صلى الله عليك يا رسول الله صلى الله عليك يا سيدي ويا مولاي يا أبا عبد الله يا رحمة الله الواسعة ويا باب نجاة الأمة ويا عبرة كل مؤمن ومؤمنة يا ليتنا فيا ليتنا كنا معكم سيدي فنفوز والله فوزا عظيما قال تعالى في كتابه الكريم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وإن خفتم شقاق بينهما فابعثوا حكما من أهله فابعثوا حكما من أهله وحكما من أهلها إن يريد إصلاحا يوفق الله بينهما صدق الله العلي العظيم صلوا على محمد وآل محمد Respected elders, brothers and sisters, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. It is narrated in a hadith, a famous tradition recorded in Sunni and Shia sources, where the Prophet was once sitting with his companions and he was speaking to them about Akhirul Zaman. He was speaking to them about the signs of the end of times. And he says to his Sahaba, he says, كَيْفَ بِكُمْ إِذَا فَسَدَتْ نِسَاءُكُمْ وَفَسَقَ شَبَابُكُمْ What will become of you? The Prophet is speaking to us, the Muslims. What will become of you? When your women become corrupt and your youth become sinful. وَلَمْ تَأْمُرُوا بِالْمَعْرُوفِ وَلَمْ تَنْهَوْ عَنِ الْمُنْكَرِ The Prophet says, what is going to happen to you in Akhir zaman And he describes Akhir zaman as a time in which people will no longer enjoin what is good and forbid what is evil. I already mentioned that we've already passed the point in our communities where there are many issues where we are afraid to discuss from the mimbar. There's munkar, but everybody's afraid of being canceled. See, the Prophet predicted this. There will be a fear to speak against munkar. And people tell me all the time, Sheikh, be careful, you're going to get canceled. Baba, what is it, a Netflix subscription? Cancel me. Who cares? وَلَمْ تَأْمُرُوا بِالْمَعْرُوفِ وَلَمْ تَنْهَوْ عَنِ الْمُنْكَرِ The Sahaba, they were shocked. They said, وَيَكُونُ ذَلِكَ يَا رَسُولَ اللَّهِ Is this really going to happen? The Prophet says, Naam, wa sharrum min dhalik. That will happen. 
But what is even worse is going to happen. What is worse than that, Ya Rasulullah? كَيْفَ بِكُمْ إِذَا أَمَرْتُمْ بِالْمُنْكَرِ وَنَهَيْتُمْ عَنِ الْمَعْرُوفِ what will become of you Muslims when you enjoin what is evil, you encourage evil, and you forbid what is good? Today, you see, you want a prime example of this? Go on social media. The Muslims now with their likes and their retweets, in many cases, were, in, they were encouraging fasad. Fisq, we encourage it. Sahaba again were shocked. وَيَكُونُ ذَلِكَ يَا رَسُولَ اللَّهِ Is this going to happen, Ya Rasulullah? Rasulullah says, نَعَمْ وَشَرٌ مِنْ ذَلِكَ The Prophet says, yes, this is going to happen. And something even worse is going to happen. Allahu Akbar, what is worse than that? قَالَ كَيْفَ بِكُمْ إِذَا رَأَيْتُمُ الْمُنْكَرَ مَعْرُوفًا كَيْفَ بِكُمْ إِذَا رَأَيْتُمُ الْمُنْكَرَ مَعْرُوفًا وَالْمَعْرُوفَ مُنْكَرًا The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wa he says, it is going to be worse in Akhir Zaman. The Muslims will reach a point where they will perceive evil as good. And they will perceive good as evil. Meaning the Prophet ﷺ predicted that there will come a time in Akhir zaman where people will not even have Islamic values anymore. I can read a hadith of Ja'far al-Sadiq and it sounds evil to the people. And then you bring the words of someone who's an atheist, the furthest away from Islam, and people say, Subhanallah, mashallah, so good. What Simone de Beauvoir says is ma'roof. And what Ali ibn Abi Talib says is munkar in the minds of the Muslims. My dear brothers and sisters, the reason why many of us have trouble digesting the Qur'an and the Ahadith of Ahlul Bayt is because we have internalized secular and liberal values to such an extent that it has completely turned our moral system upside down. And this has affected even our marriages. What Islam says is good for a man is now considered evil. What Islam says is good for a woman is a concentration camp. It's dhulm. Tonight's lecture is about marital conflict. But I had to mention this in the beginning for us to understand what a dire situation we are in as a community. We get married, we do the Islamic nikah, but husband and wife enter Islamic marriages with un-Islamic values. We don't even understand the purpose of marriage anymore. Marriage is for me to have a travel buddy so I can take pictures when I travel around the world. Believe me, we laugh, but this is the reality. The same people that will post a hadith They'll post a hadith, but they don't really have Islamic values. I just want to travel partner so I can show the world that how wonderful my life is. My life, my marriage is now a business. People get married. I want to get married because I just want to be happy. Now, Islam is not against happiness. But marriage is so much more deeper than personal happiness. Because if your goal, if your primary goal of marriage is that I want to be happy, you're setting yourself up for failure. Because this dunya is a place of bala. After the wedding of Ali and Fatima, salawatullahi alayhima, Allahumma salli ala Muhammad.
Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi visited the newlyweds the morning after the wedding. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi goes to Ali ibn Abi Talib and he asks him, Ya Ali, kayfa wajadta ahlak? Oh Ali, what do you think about your wife, your new bride? Do you know what Amir al Mu'minin says? Qala ya Rasulullah, ni'ma al awn ala ta'atillah. She is the best partner in submitting to Allah. This is, this is what marriage is. We think marriage is just, oh, we just want to have fun and travel and eat and just... There's more to marriage. There's a reason why the Prophet says, مَا بُنِيَ فِي الْإِسْلَامِ بِنَاءٌ أَحَبُّ إِلَى اللَّهِ مِنَ التزويج. There is no institution that is more beloved to Allah than the institution of marriage. Why? Is it because Allah just wants us to throw parties and take pictures and post stuff on Instagram? Why is marriage so valuable? What is the meaning of marriage? What are we trying to achieve? We want to enter into a relationship that will help us cultivate noble traits that will make us qualified for Allah's special mercy, which is Jannah. Marriage is not about I'm looking for the perfect person. You're not going to find a perfect person because you're not a perfect person and we're not mahsumin. Start looking at marriage as an institution that will help me perfect myself. Because when you were single, it was all about you. Your whole life revolved around yourself. When you get married, you have to de-emphasize your nafs. When you get married, you have to think about others. You have to sacrifice. You have to have patience. And these are all of the qualities of Ahlul Jannah. So number one, let us first acknowledge how far we have drifted from Islamic values. Number two, we have to understand that marriage serves a deep purpose and that is to develop our spirituality. It wasn't meant to be easy. Sometimes people say, Shaykh, I, I don't want to be married. Love should be effortless. That's a very dangerous idea and we hear this all the time. When you find the right person, it should be effortless. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, he teaches us that marriage is not easy. It's challenging to be a good husband. It's challenging to be a good wife. Jihadul mar'a husnu taba'ul. The Prophet himself, he says, the jihad of a woman is to be good to her husband. I'm not saying this. If you have a problem with this, you have a problem with Rasulullah. The Prophet acknowledges that your husband is not going to be easy sometimes. It requires sacrifice on both. It's a jihad. And look at what the, the Prophet calls it a jihad, meaning this is something that's noble. Because in Islam, someone who's mujahid is honored. It's difficult. It's a struggle. Do you know how much thawab you will receive, my dear sisters, when your husband irritates you and you want to smack him upside the head and you say, sabrun jameel? There's a lot of thawab in that. It's difficult. But welcome, welcome to the institution of marriage. This is where you build yourself. These are the things that we have to keep in mind before we enter marriage. We will avoid so much unnecessary conflict if we change our frame of thinking. There are some very dangerous ideas that we bring into our marriages. 
One of them, for example, is, and this is something that is always echoed from the member. It is not wajib upon a wife to do any household chores. Now the sisters are thinking, yeah. Thanks, Sheikh. That's true, right? It is not wajib. Yes, technically it's true. And the reason why I said technically. Imagine I sat on the mimbar and I said, Brothers, sisters, salatul layl is not wajib. Am I right? Technically I'm right. But I missed something that is very critical. And that is what? It's mustahab. It's mustahab. Now I know that my respected sisters may be frustrated when they hear this. And I know why and I understand why. Because many brothers do not appreciate. Many brothers do not do enough at home. They throw all of the burden on the sisters. So that's why we get that reaction. So in many ways it is justified. You have to be appreciative. But we shouldn't pretend as though these domestic chores have no value. Sometimes we feel like these things are very mundane. They don't have value. There's a very beautiful hadith from Imam al-Sadiq salawatullahi alayhi. Where Imam, he says, Um Salama, she came to the Prophet. And she said to the Prophet, yeah, what is the reward that women get for, you know, these domestic chores. I mean, you, you almost get the sense that Um Salama, the wife of the Prophet, is thinking that the men are doing all of the adventurous stuff. Jihad, they're going out, and we're at home doing these mundane things. Like, we're, we're at home doing this trivial stuff. It doesn't have value. What, what are we going to get for this? What does the Prophet ﷺ say? فَقَالَ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَآلِهِ لَا بَصَلُّوا عَلَى مُحَمَّدٍ وَآلِ مُحَمَّدٍ فَقَالَ أَيُّ مَنْ مْرَأَةٍ رَفَعَتْ مِنْ بَيْتِ زَوْجِهَا شَيْئًا مِنْ مَوْضِعٍ إِلَى مَوْضِعٍ تُرِيدُ بِهِ صَلَاحَ The Prophet says, whenever a woman, a wife, a mother, she moves one thing from one place in the house to another. She makes a small adjustment to the furniture, to the house, and she does it to make her family more comfortable. One thing, a small little movement. Rasulullah says, Illa nazar Allahu ilayha. She does something small in the house to make the kids more comfortable, her husband more comfortable, her parents more comfortable if they're there, the family more comfortable. The Prophet says, when a woman does that, Allah gazes upon her with mercy. And if Allah gazes at someone with mercy, He will never punish them. This is Islam. Now this doesn't mean that, oh, alhamdulillah, Shaykh, thank you so much. We're going to bring you next year, alhamdulillah, because we love this. We love to hear this. The brothers should not take advantage. It's not wajib upon your wife. It's mustahab. But it's also mustahab for you to serve, to look after your family. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi in another hadith, he says, إِنَّ الرَّجُلَ إِذَا, إذا سَقَ مْرَأَتَهُ مِنَ الْمَاءُ أُجِرْ Rasulullah says, if a husband brings a cup of water for his wife, he will be rewarded by Allah Azza wa Jal. You go, don't think you're the, you're the big guy. Honey, lunch. You're the Don at home, right? One of the brothers. 
I met up with him. Sheikh, I'm the king of the house. I'm the king of the castle. Look, keep your voices down. The Prophet sallallahu he says that the husband is rewarded for these kind gestures. Don't even wait for her to ask. Anticipate. Anticipate. Be observant. In another hadith, the Prophet says, خِدْمَتُكَ زَوْجَتَكَ صَدَقَ Serving your wife. Helping her with the laundry, with the dishes, with the cooking, vacuuming, whatever she needs help with. The Prophet says, this is sadaqah. This is the best sadaqah you can give. And then there's a beautiful hadith. You know, because sometimes some guys may start to feel emasculated, and this is, not, this is not good. They feel that, you know, I'm doing things that are not manly. I don't like to do it. I don't like to do the dishes. I don't like to cook. I don't like to do laundry. It feels very emasculating. That's not right. This is the masculinity that Islam rejects. This false masculinity. Rasulullah says to Amir al-Mu'mineen, he says, Ya Ali, la yakhdum al-iyal illa siddiq aw shaheed aw rajulun yuridullahu bihi khayra dunya wa al-akhirah. Oh Ali, the man, only a saint, a martyr, or a man whom Allah wishes the best in dunya and akhirah, does Allah give him the tawfiq of serving his family. This is the mindset that we have to have. So this whole wajib, haram, we can't think about domestic chores that it's wajib for, it's not wajib upon the man, and it's not wajib upon the woman. So who is it wajib upon? Nobody. You figure it out. You have to come to an understanding. Every family is different. But don't minimize the value of these domestic chores for the man and for the woman. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Another very damaging idea that we bring into our marriages that often destroys our marriages. And this one may shock you. So recite a salawat before you get shocked. One of the most destructive mindsets to bring into a family is the idea of happy wife, happy life. Happy wife, happy life. This is like a hadith to us. Happy wife, happy life. You memorize Surah Al-Fatiha. Happy wife, happy life. It's part of our manhaj. The reason why this is a very damaging mindset for women and men is because it prioritizes the happiness of one of them. Islam teaches that you should not prioritize the happiness of one partner over the other. What is more Islamic, if we want to come up with a new slogan, is happy spouse, happy house. Because the, this one is having problems. We don't want to, we don't want to have laughter. Happy spouse, happy house means what? There's a husband and a wife. The wife's happiness matters and the husband's happiness also matters. You see what happens, brothers and sisters, when you indoctrinate a generation of men to have this mentality, and you indoctrinate a generation of women to have this mentality, you know what happens? You do, you do something, something that is very destructive to the, to, dynamic, to the dynamic of the marriage. Of the marriage. What, happens what happens is, is naturally, naturally the, man the man becomes, becomes fully, fully submissive, submissive and the wife be becomes, completely dominant. becomes completely dominant. And this is very dangerous. This is very dangerous. And this is not misogyny. And this is not misogyny. This is found in the riwayat of Ahlul Bayt. But people, don't read. Read. Bait, but people don't read. And that's why I mentioned the hadith that's in the beginning. That's why I mentioned the hadith in the beginning. What you think is what you munkar is actually ma'roof. 
it's very damaging to our relationship. And the reason why it's, it happens so often, the reason why so many husbands are fully controlled and influenced by their wives, you know why? Because too many men today are immature. Too many men today don't act like men. Do you know how many times sisters come? How many kids do you have? She says, I have three kids. I have two little boys and my husband. It's true. So the brothers can get all offended, but this is the reality. We're not raising mature men. So what has to happen? It's not their fault. They have to, de they have to develop these dominant traits because you failed as a man. And then something very dangerous happens. I want you to pay very close attention to what I say. Because this is the diagnosis for so much of our so many of our issues. When a man is fully dominated by his wife, and mainly it's his fault, what happens? the respect that that wife has for her husband begins to diminish. And who is completely under her, her, uh, her control. And then what happens? A woman cannot fully love a man that she doesn't respect. And then what else happens? will find it very difficult to be intimate with a man she does not love. That's it. That's what I've observed all around the world. This is the problem. And the irony of ironies, and it's sad, because both of them don't know what's wrong. Because this poor guy did everything he was told to do happy wife happy life whatever you say jump how high I did everything right and the woman doesn't understand he's listening to me he does whatever I tell him to do they're confused it's because the entire system has influenced us to go against our fitrah. I know this is very deep. It's very scary. But this is happening around the world, my dear brothers and sisters. And I'm not a conspiracy theorist. I'm not saying that this was planned, but this is what is happening. You know, in pre-modern times, in the past, when armies, when tribes would conquer villages, what's the first thing that they would do to exercise dominance? Kill all the men. Keep the women alive. Kill all the men. That's generally, there might be some exceptions, but that's generally how it worked in the pre-modern world. In the modern world, they can't kill the men, so they kill the masculine spirit. They kill the masculine spirit. And this is why this lecture series began with a discussion about reviving Muslim masculinity. And it's all around us. It's on television. It's everywhere. Some of our favorite shows growing up feature emasculated men. You guys have seen Friends? Everybody loves Friends. It's a good show. We grew up on it. Notice that every man is weak, emotional, indecisive. Everybody loves Raymond. These shows, always, almost always, weak, emasculated. So we grew up thinking, that, oh, this is funny, this is cute. Happy wife, happy life, all of this comes together, and you create the perfect storm. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. The next misconception, 
can we please ask the brothers to move forward? Please move forward. Stand up. Rahimallahu man dhakar al qa'im min Ali Muhammad. Another dangerous misconception that we carry into our marriages that has no Islamic basis, but it is taught like it is an Islamic value. And I even saw a clip of this today where sisters are taught the following, and even brothers are taught it. My money is my money, and his money is, his money is my money. Wrong. The first part is right. My money is my money. Yes. Even if your wife is a multi-millionaire, she doesn't have to use that money to maintain herself. And even if the husband is poor, he has to work and provide for her. Because Allah knows the fitrah of a man. He knows that his sense of worth depends on his ability to provide. The moment it's swapped, finished. It's, it's very hard to maintain a healthy relationship. Something happens deep within the human being. My money is my money. Good. But his money is my money. This is where the problem is. In Islam, see this is why people need to study fiqh. In Islam, it is wajib upon your husband. What is wajib upon him is nafaqa. To provide, to financially support you. Based on your socioeconomic status. What is typically given to a woman of your status? It needs to be mutabiq li sha'niha. So for example, let's say your husband earns a hundred thousand a year and your maintenance for you to be fully covered requires thirty thousand the seventy thousand is his you need permission to use it now there are many husbands who are kind and they say i give her i give her a blank check sheikh i don't even have my credit card it's with her that's fine but don't come into a marriage with these unrealistic expectations. You come into the marriage with happy wife, happy life mentality, and my money is my money, and his money is my money. Then naturally what happens? You come into the marriage with un-Islamic values. So these are some of the things that we have to change before we enter the marriage. Conflict is inevitable. Sorry to break it to you, brothers and sisters. Marriage is not without problems. There are going to be issues. You're going to get into arguments. But there's a very powerful verse in the Quran that we should remember. Now, it's, it's about divorce, but it's a general principle. Allah says, وَلَا تَنْسَوُ الْفَضْلَ بَيْنَكُمْ when you're angry at each other, don't forget the goodness that you showed each other. You're angry with your wife. You asked her to do something and she didn't. She did something to expect you. You're angry. And that's all you can focus on. The one thing that she did wrong. Allah says, don't forget all of those years where she was with you. Don't forget all of the sacrifices she made. And the same applies to the sisters. You're angry with your husband? Don't say things like, I've never seen any goodness from you. You're this, you're that. Do not forget, forget the goodness. And also remember that you're not perfect either. You're angry at your spouse. They do things that are irritating. They have shortcomings. You also have shortcomings. 
We have to remember this, my dear brothers and sisters. If we enter a marriage with this mindset, we will avoid a lot of unnecessary conflicts. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Now let's say there is a fight that breaks out. Not a fist fight. We don't, I hope it doesn't get to that level. There's an argument. There's a conflict now in the marriage. The worst thing that you can do when you have conflict is to get outsiders involved. Especially in the beginning. Try your absolute best to resolve the issue internally. Because if you pick up the phone and you call your cousin and she calls her mom and the aunt and the brother, you brought too many people. You created a war now when it could have been resolved very quietly. So when there is a conflict, keep it, try to resolve it internally. Number two, when you are angry, stay silent. There's a hadith from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wa He says, there's the narrations from Amir al-Mu'mineen, Dawul Ghadab Bissamt. Medicate your anger with silence. When you're angry, don't engage. Don't text when you're angry. In fact, if it's an issue don't try to resolve it through text messages. Because we all know you cannot read tone through text. Maybe they're being very gentle, but it sounds like they're angry and you're responding to the tone more than you're responding to the content. You can easily misread each other. When you're angry, as the Prophet says, if you're sitting, stand up. If you're standing up, sit. Go do wudu. The point is, do not try to solve conflict when you are angry. Let both sides cool down. If you are not able to resolve it internally, Islam doesn't say, that's it. Throw in the, throw in the towel. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah An-Nisa, he mentions, وَإِنْ خِفْتُمْ شِقَاقَ بَيْنِهِمَا If there is fear of separation, meaning that the problem is getting serious, the couple is about to break up, Allah says what? فَبْعَثُوا حَكَمًا مِّنْ أَهْلِهِ وَحَكَمًا مِّنْ أَهْلِهِ Bring an arbiter from both sides. It doesn't need to be a scholar. Someone who you see who, who's going to be on your side who's going to be fair, but is on your side. An uncle, a relative, who knows you very well, but who's going to be objective. Because sometimes, when you're in a fight with your spouse, you think they're in the wrong. But if a friend, an uncle says that, I think you went too far. You wouldn't have accepted from your spouse, but because the uncle, the cousin, the friend told you, bro, you took it too far. You tell your sister, my dear sister, he's right. He has a point there. You bring the other so you can quell the ego. Sometimes you need to hear outside advice. And if this doesn't work, and Allah says, he gives a very powerful promise here. He says, إِسْلَاحًا يُوَفِّقِ اللَّهُ بَيْنَهُمْ if both sides, husband and wife, truly, for the sake of Allah, they want reconciliation and they make dua to Him, Allah says, I promise I'll bring your hearts together. How many times do we get into fights? We call everybody, but we don't turn to Him. We call the lawyer before, before we call Allah Azza wa Jal. You should have said to Allah, Ya Allah, Ya Muqallib al Qulub. Oh Allah, you're the turner of hearts. Turn my husband's heart. Turn my heart. Maybe I'm the problem. Don't underestimate the power of dua. 
Allah says, if you are sincere in your pursuit of reconciliation, Allah says, I will help you. Sometimes it doesn't work. You might want to reconcile, but maybe the other side doesn't want to. Because you can't force people. Sometimes you have to go your separate ways. Sometimes there is no other option but divorce. But if you're going to get a divorce, my dear brothers and sisters, know the ahkam of talaq. Know what Islam teaches about divorce. I've seen it time and time again. The moment there is divorce, the marriage is finished, and also taqwa is out the window. There's no more taqwa. Every side is trying to get the most powerful lawyer. Every side is trying to squeeze and gouge the other. I want to stick him where it hurts. I want to take everything from her. And you see both sides. They oppress each other. They commit sins that only Allah knows what they are going to encounter on the Day of Judgment. There are husbands who don't want the wives. They don't want them as wives, but they don't want to give them a divorce. They leave them hanging. Because they're so egotistical and so controlling that in their mind, I don't like her, but I'm not going to let anyone else have her. And shame on them for that. This is cowardice. If Ali ibn Abi Talib, Rasulullah, if they were to witness such men, they would say, Ya ashbah rijal wa la rijal. You're not men. And there are those who will deprive their wives of their mahar. It's her haq. But he'll get a lawyer and because there's no paperwork, Yalla, mashi. And he thinks he's clever. But this money that you took from this woman is fire in your belly. You usurped it. And sometimes the other, the other side, there are some sisters. Some sisters are oppressed, yes, but some sisters are vicious. We can't pretend that there are not vicious women. There are. You have brothers. You know. You have sons. You know that there are women who can be vicious. Their mahar, for example, 10,000. That's their mahar. Oh, but no, it's not going to stop at 10,000. I'm going to get the best lawyer, and I'm going to take your house. I'm going to take half of your wealth. And when the court issues the verdict in my favor, I'm going to celebrate, alhamdulillah. Yeah, you got the house. Now, assuming if the house really did belong to her, then that's a different issue. But if it doesn't belong to you and you did this out of revenge, you can't pray in that house because that house has been usurped. The extra money that you took, you want to pray, you want to travel. Yeah, you think you won. You might have won the battle, but you lost the war with Allah Azza wa Jal. You have to be very careful. These are the moments where our iman is tested. Your iman is not tested when it's Salat al-Dhuhr and you're in your air-conditioned home and it's all good. Your iman is not tested when you just come to the majlis and it's easy, your day off. Your iman is tested when your ego is involved. That's when it's tested. That's when the mu'min is separated from the munafiq. These are the issues of our time, my dear brothers and sisters. These are the moments when our iman is tested. And tonight, we speak about the companions of Imam al Hussein. These are the individuals whose iman was tested. Everybody loved Imam al Hussein, but talk is cheap. Talk is cheap. What are you going to do when your feet are held to the fire? That's when it's, that's when the men are separated from the boys. Imam al Hussein alayhi salam, he loved his companions. Real men. On the eve of Ashura, he would look at their faces and he would say, 
إني لم أرى أصحابا خيرا ولا أوفى من أصحابي. I have never found, I don't have, no one has better companions than me. Companions who are more loyal than my companions. Imam al Hussein alayhi salam on the eve of Ashura, he was walking among the tents. He senses someone behind him. He hears footsteps behind him. Who's behind him? Imam says, Man ant. He says, Ya ibn Rasulullah, I'm Nafi'. I'm your companion. It's me. Imam Hussein says, what do you need? Nafi' says, Ya ibn Rasulullah, I'm worried about you walking alone on a night like this. These are treacherous people. I want to make sure you're safe. I want to make sure you're protected. Imam Hussein says, may Allah bless you. But this army... They only want me. They don't want any of you. So Nafi', you see that hill, those two little hills? Take advantage of the night and run. Save yourself. Nafi', please go. He says, Ya Aba Abdullah, Qabbahallahu al Aishu Ba'dak. Ya Aba Abdullah, what value does life have? After you. We're with you. Step by step. We're with you until the end. The companions of Imam al Hussein alayhi salam are unique. On the day of Ashura, one of the companions of the Imam, there was actually a young boy who came to Imam al Hussein. Imam al Hussein alayhi salam, he says, No, send this young boy back. Because his father was killed earlier in the battle. And I don't think his mother wants to handle another calamity. So he tells the boy, Amr ibn Junad al Ansari, little boy, he says to him, Go back to your mother. I don't think your mother wants you to go to the battlefield. The boy says, Ya Aba Abdullah. <laughs> ya Aba Abdullah, my mother is the one who came and told me to come to you. He says, no, 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 please go back to your mother. I cannot see a beautiful child like you get slaughtered. He goes back. And the mother takes the hand of her boy. And she walks to Imam al Hussein and she says, Ya Aba Abdullah, give my son permission to enter and fight. Imam says, I don't want you to mourn for him. أتذكل أمك الزهراء بولدها ولا أثقل بولدي يا أبا عبد الله how is it acceptable that فاطمة الزهراء should mourn for her son while I don't mourn for my son the Imam عليه السلام he gives him permission to go and fight his father was killed. He was an orphan in his final hours, no father. The others, when they come forward, they recite poetry. They introduce usually their names and the name of their father and who they are. But this orphan boy, he doesn't introduce himself to the enemy using his name. What does he say? He introduces himself saying that Hussein is my emir. This young boy, when he enters the battlefield, he stands in front of this army. Everyone is wondering, who is this young boy? He recites the poetry. Amiri Hussein wa ni'mal amir Suroo 
فؤاد البشير النذير Who are, who are the parents of Hussein? Ali wa Fatima walida. Fahal ta'lamu nalahu min nadir. He fights until he's martyr. Companion after companion, they fall until the sun reaches its zenith. One of the One companions of, the companions of Imam al-Hussein, Abu Thumamat al-Sa'idi, he comes to the Imam in the middle of the battle. He looks up at the sun. He says, Yabna Rasulillah, Aba Abdullah, I know we're in battle, but it is the time of salah now. Imam al-Hussein, he looks up at the sun. He sees that the sun is directly overhead. What does he say? He looks at the sun. Does he say to him, we're in the middle of a battle? What do you mean, Salah? He looks up at the sun and he says, Yes, this is the beginning of the time of Salah. This is the Fadila time of Salah. And then he makes a dua for this man for remembering Salah. Imam says, may Allah make you always among the ones who pray. They pray Salat al khawf Imam al Hussein is preparing for Salah. But the, he asks the army, Oh, Umar ibn Sa'ad, it is the time of Salah. Let us pause the battle so we can pray. Hussein ibn Numair, he shouts out at Imam al Hussein saying, Ya Hussein, Salah to Kala Tuqbal. This man, this he man, says he to Imam al Hussein that, Oh, Hussein, your salah is not accepted. Habib ibn Mudahir al Asadi, he stands up and he shouts at the man. He says, Wayhak ya mal'oon, your salah is accepted, but the salah of the grandson of Rasulullah is not accepted. Ya mal'oon. The narration say, Zuhair ibn al qain stands in front of Imam al Hussein because the enemy would not stop shooting their arrows even as the Imam prayed. Imam says, I need two volunteers to stand in front and absorb the arrows while we do our salah. Zuhair ibn al qain he stands. Saeed ibn Abdullah al-Hanafi, he stands. Imagine, your job is to absorb arrows with your neck and face and chest so Imam al Hussein can pray. Allahu Akbar, Imam Salah begins. The arrows begin to shower. Zuhair catches the arrows, Saeed catches the arrows with his neck. The arrows continue to shower. Saeed ibn Abdullah is absorbing the arrows. He's being hit and hit and hit. He's holding himself. He wants to fall. He's in pain. He's holding himself until he hears Imam al Hussein finish his salah. The moment Imam al Hussein finishes his salah, when he hears the taslim of Aba Abdullah, he gives up and he falls on the plate. <laughs> He looks he at looks Imam al Hussein. His body is like a porcupine. He looks at Imam al Hussein. He says, Awafayna ma'aka ya Aba Abdullah. He says to him, Ya Aba Abdullah, were we loyal to you, Ya Abdullah Rasulullah? He says, Yes, you were loyal to me. Send my salam to my grandfather. You will see him now. 
لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم وسيعلم الذين ظلموا آل محمد أي منقلب ينقلبون صلوا على محمد وآل محمد